Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us here in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. As the World Turns alum, Keith Kalouris is here to look back at his time in Oakdale playing Reed Hamilton, David Stenbeck, the son of the notorious villain James Stenbeck. Keith portrayed David Stenbeck uh, and also appeared as Keith Schaefer on One Life to Live. Keith has worked alongside legends such as Bruce Stern and Joe Clayburgh and appeared as a guest star in long-running primetime hit series, including The X-Files, Murder, She Wrote, Silk Stockings, Married with Children, and so much more. He also appeared in the independent feature, Shadow People, which he wrote, directed, produced, and edited. Keith received the award for Best Digital Feature at the Sonoma Film Festival for Shadow People. Please help me welcome to the locker room, Keith Kalaris. Hey, Keith. Hey, good to see you. You too, my friend. It's been a long time, so I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. It's my pleasure. It's nice seeing your face, man. <laughs> Same here. Hearing your voice is great because you you have such a distinct voice. Um, Thank you. T tell me about the boys. Jackson uh, it just turned 24 and Alec will turn 19 in June, right? Yep, that's right. Uh, they're doing fantastic. You know, uh, they're my best friends and um, they're both thriving. Uh, Alec is at school in New York studying music, his passion, um, living the life you can imagine being that young and living in the city. Uh, and he's there with some friends that also went there from the same high school. So he's got this great community there. He's thriving. Uh, Jackson is here in LA. Um, he's doing several creative things. He actually works with me at my company. He does voice work, uh, oh, wow. which we can talk about more, obviously. Yeah. Um, so he's doing some voice work. He does a lot of creative stuff. He's a really talented photographer and cinematographer and editor. So he's been doing a lot of editing for music videos and short form projects for people. Um, he's an amazing artist. He's still doing art and drawing. And so he's just doing a lot of things that he loves and fun to watch. Well, then he, he definitely got the creative bug from you and Leslie. I mean, or both of them really. If Jackson's yeah. in New York with music and you know, they, they've definitely got that gene from the two of you. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think it's hard to ignore that, you know, when you have two parents that are so steeped in it, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do I have it right that you grew up in Pennsylvania? Yeah, I started out in Pennsylvania. I was, I was born there and lived there the first 12 years uh, in Lancaster and Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And, but then, and what, were, what were you like as a kid? Uh, that's, that's a, it's a big question. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I grew up in places that creativity wasn't necessarily something that was fostered as much as sports and other things, you know, um, outdoorsy kind of things. Um, but I was always creative. I, I, I love to write creatively since I could hold a pencil. Um, I was a bit of a performer, a class clown. You know, that was always kind of my thing. I love to entertain in that way. Um, maybe not to the pleasure of my teachers. <clears throat> <laughs> Were but, you uh, writing but, back then? Yeah, you, I, yeah, you know, it, I mean, most of it was stuff for school, but like those were always the courses that I thrived in. Anytime there was, you know, English or uh, creative. And then later in high school, I took creative writing courses. I wrote for the school newspaper. You know, I, I, I always was, I suppose, equally or more into writing as performing. You know, I did some plays in school, but writing was more my uh, my focus, you know. Um, and then I, I, you know, I did the sports thing and that because that's what every kid did. And I liked it, but I was never like a star athlete or anything. I was always, you know, much happier in that creative realm. And so where did the love of theater begin? Again, I think it started just from initially just liking to make people laugh and just entertain people. And then it really... Uh, you know, it really came to a head in college, honestly, because I, I knew I wanted to do something creative, but I thought I was going to write. I, I wanted to either write commercially or write in television and film. And that's what my major was in college. You know, I was a television and film major focusing on uh, screenplay writing. But uh, I met a guy who was a martial artist who wanted to be a, a stuntman and an actor and was planning. He was a year ahead of me in school and he was planning on moving out to California. 
And he was like, hey, you know, if you want to write for entertainment, you should move out. I'm going to be moving out there. You should go. He said, take some acting classes. You guys, you're, you're a good looking guy. You know, you could just take some classes. Maybe you can go out for commercials or something. So I dove in my, my junior year of college. And that's when it, it really hit me how much I loved it. Like I told you I did other things growing up, but I was never like, again, never a star athlete, never got the best grades, whatever. Acting was one of the first things that I got immediate positive feedback and, you know, rose to the to the top of like those classes I was in, the feedback I was getting from the professors. And, you know, when you get that kind of feedback, it stokes your enthusiasm, you know, and those, that fire in you. And um, it was just no looking back at that point. You know, I took every class I could, performance of literature, speech, did every play I could do at school that, those last couple of years. And then my butt, it, it, I won't get into the long-winded story, but... <laughs> I had but, such, but you did end up out west, right? Yeah, but I had the most interesting serendipitous course of events happen that I could have never, you know, planned that that got me to be a working actor. And it started in North Carolina on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that they shot in North Carolina, the first live action one back in 1992. Actually, it was the sequel to it. Yeah. Were you going to school in North Carolina? Yeah, I was Where? going to Chapel Hill, UNC. Oh wow, my my nephews are uh, UNC graduates, but from one one Asheville, one Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, those are those are both. I, I knew people went to both those schools. Yeah, I mean, everyone from high school was like in, in one of those UNCs, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was at Chapel Hill, uh, and um, you know, long story short. I went to visit my my buddy. Got a part in that Ninja Turtles movie because he was a martial artist. He was Rafa, He was in the Raphael suit doing the martial arts right and he has his own interesting story because we were two kids that had no connections to the industry at all we were just you know saw that they were shooting this thing so i was actually with a friend who had a job interview down there and i was like oh my buddy's shooting this ninja turtles movie we you know i can visit him while we're there. i'll go with you for your job interview and we're checking into a motel and the two girls at the desk who were uh working the motel desk were also casting bit roles for teenage mutant ninja turtles no idea. We just happened to choose this motel. My buddy goes, Hey, you got to come in here. They're, they're casting bit roles. I went in there. They knew my friend. They, they gave me some sides to audition for a bit role, went out to the car and rehearsed with my buddy quick, came in. Next thing I knew I had a call back. I got my first part, got my SAG card. It just all happened so quickly. Your SAG card off of that movie. Yep. Wow. And then I went back two weeks later and auditioned to be a stunt fighter and got hired as a stunt fighter. And then, so I did my day player thing and got my SAG eligibility. Then for three months, I was a, a stunt fighter. I was in a black ninja costume fighting turtles for three months <laughs> uh, with my best friend at the time, you know, and we're living on the beach shooting. It was just magical, you know? But I mean, that's why like when people ask me, you know, younger actors ask me like, you know, well, what's the blueprint? They want like a blueprint to get in. I said, man, I'm not the guy to ask because you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. I was certainly preparing, but who would have guessed that I'd check into a motel where the yeah. casting associates happened to be working, you know, and, and I had several things like that happen in the beginning that got me in, you know, to being a working there, actor. There are such interesting things that, you know, just, it's like, you know, you make that left turn or that right turn and you just end up in, in, in the right, you know, it, it happened to me. I mean, somebody overheard, that I wanted to get into entertainment and got me a job as a page at ABC and changed my, the entire course of my life. Yep. You know, right. it, it, yeah. Like if she, if she was not listening to the conversation, who knows what I would have ended up doing for the last 30 years. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's, you, I love you that. Know so. What a, you know, one kind gesture from someone can do, or just like you said, just choosing to go the right place at the right time. It's, it's so up in the air. Yeah. And the best you can do, which I'm sure you did as well, is you you, you be prepared. So when those opportunities come up, you know, you, you do. And, and, you know, you just go in with your eyes open, like you went in and, and you know, the, the women at the desk are like, here, have a job. Like, it's yeah. crazy. Well, I I love was, well, you know, I was also young enough to have no idea the the, the, the mountain that was in front of me you know, and what other people were dealing with. You know, you're that young. You're just like, yeah, I'm right. going to be an actor. Sure, I'll take those sides and read them for you. And I'm the best person you're going to read. You know, you're just like, you have no yeah. fear, you know. That's so true. So did that 
uh, lead you to go out west from there? Yeah. So and my buddy and I worked on that movie, as I said, for for a good while. Um, and that led right up to like Christmas of 1990. And then the day after Christmas, I packed up the my meager ownings and my geo prism and drove cross country with that friend of mine. Plus, if, uh, we had two or three other friends that were interested in some aspect of, of the entertainment industry. And we all moved out together and, uh, you know, started our journey. Wow. Did you... Uh, pursue an agent once getting there this is another another ridiculous story so one of the guys i move out there with wanted to be he was interested in casting and producing or whatever so he was sending out vhs tapes of himself <laughs> to <laughs> casting directors where he just did this charming little video and like i remember he said uh you know hello mr so-and-so you know i'm tony summers and i'm interested in and, and he said and he has a guitar on his on his chest he said and i thought i'd play a little song for you but I realized I don't know how to play guitar. So <laughs> and he takes it up and that's how he started the video. And this one casting director was really enamored by it and brought him in and, and hired him as an assistant. Well, that manager was also, uh, that casting director was also a manager of actors. My buddy told him about me. He was nice enough to meet me on a Saturday and run through some scenes with me and, you know, and uh, thought I had something and wanted to manage me. And that, that's how I met my manager. Yeah. What was your first paying gig out there? Uh, it was a Saturday morning show called Harry and the Hendersons, okay. um, which which was wonderful because uh, Bruce Davison was the the dad on the show, who's a wonderful uh, who's done some movies I adore like Longtime Companion uh, and several yeah, others. I knew. So it was a silly little show, but it's always nice to work next to someone like that, you know. And he was sweet and kind and. Um, but it was just this goofy little guest star on there. But 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 it was on the Universal lot. And I'll never forget because it really was only less than a year that I moved out there. So it wasn't like I was this suffering, starving actor for very long. This was like 10 months probably after I moved out there. But I was working at Banana Republic and I was bummed, you know, and and I was auditioning, but I just it was I couldn't book. So when I booked that, it was just such a relief. You know, and it was on the Universal lot. I got to drive onto the lot and walk across. I was going to say, driving onto Universal's lot is is a is a, you know, thing of itself. I've done it yeah. myself, and it's, it's you, you know, feel you like know you're, you're yeah. there to work. You know, you're not you're not there as, as a right. Yeah, yeah. Man, you feel like you've arrived. I mean, that is a that is a uh, a true studio lot for sure. Yeah, there there is uh, no doubt to that. Talk about some of the other primetime stuff you did. You, Murder, She Wrote, X-Files. I, I, you know, when you think about, like, thinking back to Teenage Mutant, you had never stepped foot on a set. Like, was it just like you were just absorbing it all in and then Harry and the Hendersons? And Yeah, I mean, that actually, that Ninja Turtle movie was a wonderful, elaborate training because – you know, doing those those fight sequences, you know, you're you're working with someone that's in a mask that can barely see and you're doing, you know, and they're doing spinning kicks and all this stuff and you have to hit marks, you know, and, and make sure you're in the light and all that. So, uh, you know, that was really wonderful training to get me comfortable with, you know, a lot of people think, okay, you memorize your lines, you get on there, you do it. It's a whole different ball game to memorize your lines, hit a specific mark at a specific time, know that you're in your light, be aware of where the camera is, you know, that's a whole other aspect to it. And I was really lucky because I got to do a lot of that without really having to do a lot of lines at the same time. You know, it just sort of allowed me a nice long three or four month period to watch the other actors do these fight scenes and the choreography. And yeah, it was wonderful. Did you know stage combat? Like, how did you? I uh, I had studied a little martial arts, but I also just because I like doing, I used to break dance. I used to do, I taught myself to do a standing backflip, you know? So I was pretty good with my body, you know, just because it was something I enjoyed. And in, in, in the audition, they had you do a martial arts, you know, form, but honestly, they didn't care as much about that as how you could just throw your body around because the turtles are beating you up. The whole time. I was auditioning to be one of the guys they beat up. So you didn't have to have great technique and that really what they cared was, can you sell what it looks like when you're getting punched, you know, and, and, you know, somebody hits you and you do a backflip or something and that stuff I could do, you know, so. And I can only imagine how fun to somebody in his early twenties or it's still a teenager, even. I mean, oh, you were oh. just, yeah, it, I mean, that's yeah. like, it's like boys fun. That's like, yeah. 
It, it, exactly. It was, there were guys, so there were 20 of us that played those, they call them the foot clan, you know, the, the, the ninjas. And they were from all over the country, studied all different martial arts. And, you know, you have a lot of downtime on the sets, right? We were all teaching each other different martial arts and joking around and playing cards and playing poker. And it, it was just, yeah, it, it was just this amazing fun. Uh, and, and you do become like a family because, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of sequestered in this soundstage, you know, for months on end. And uh, I, I'll never forget, yeah, the, the fun I had and the camaraderie I felt with those guys. Yeah. I love that. So do you have a favorite primetime show you did? Um, I guess, you know, X so X-Files was interesting because I had auditioned to play Mulder on X-Files. And, 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 and I remember going in for the audition and, you know, you get a script and nobody tells you, you know, what the feel of it's going to be. You know, you're, you, you have to just make a decision and commit mm -hmm. to something. You don't have a director at home when you're learning this and you read it and you, it felt goofy to me. I thought it was going to, I thought Mulder was going to be this. So I go in with like a Spider-Man t-shirt on and a backwards hat <laughs> and, you know, and I'm playing him like this nerd, you know, like, and, uh, and obviously I didn't get it. Then I see the pilot. And I'm like, what if F didn't somebody, you know, direct me or just, yeah, I could have done it differently. Um, yeah. It's your interpretation. And if no one gives you, you know, up, you know, gives you a inkling of what they're looking for. Yeah. And, you know, but who knows, maybe they already had an offer out to the company or whatever. But um, but then I went back a, a couple more times to, to to do like there was one like three episode arc. I came close, didn't get it. And then I remember it was like so when I got on, it was like, I don't know, the eighth or ninth season or something. And there was a day player gig, you know, for a, a but it was a good day player gig. It was the, the teaser of the shits. Of, I'm the very first person you see in the teaser. You know, I'm this uh, uh, ER doctor. And um. And I went and auditioned. They offered it. And I was like, yes. I was like, I don't care if it doesn't pay. I'm going to be on the damn X-Files. Yeah. Were you a fan of it by then? Oh, yeah. I loved the show. Yeah. Is that your genre? Sort of sci-fi? Uh, it can be when it's done well. well that you I'm, like to watch. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all over the map. I, I just like a good show. If, if it doesn't even matter to me, you know. I just if like it's a written well, correct. And I felt yeah. like X-Files was unique, you know. Yeah, absolutely. definitely at that time, too, you know. In those early days, who do you think you learned the most from? I I was really lucky in that, you know, most of my work was television, but a lot of it was when the three big networks were doing a lot of TV movies. And that was like my bread and butter for a while. And and you mentioned, you know, I worked with Jill Clayburgh. I worked with Bruce Dern in those TV movies, you know, um, I, uh, what was it Doug McClure? You know, all these the, these people that I watched growing up, you know, and suddenly I was able to to work with them and beside them, you know, and 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 really interact with them, and and I learned a little something from from all of them, you know. Um, you know, Bruce Dern was very intimidating because he was like the lead villain in this western that I did, and I was the lead good guy, you know. And uh, for the first like week of shooting, I just stayed away from him. I I, I don't know, is he a method actor? I didn't, you know. And then one day at lunch, he sat down by me and we just had the nicest conversation. And um, from that point on, you know, every once in a while we'd chat a little bit and he would give me some pearl of wisdom, you know, and um, I definitely learned from him. Um, Jill Clayburg, I learned a lot just from watching how she held herself on a set, how kind she was to everyone, you know, um, and then just how she could just turn it on it, like when the camera started rolling, she was just always spot on, you know, um, and, and was just so in control of her her body and her craft, you know. And I, I learned a lot just from watching her. Um, I love um, seeing that, um, you know, how you were describing Jill and seeing her treat everyone with kindness and respect. I think that, especially when you're starting out, is such a huge. Well, I have a great little expansion story on that. So when I was first started auditioning, when that manager started working with me, one of the first things I auditioned for was the Jill Ireland story where uh, Jill Clayburgh played Jill Ireland. Uh, Charles Bronson was her husband. Uh, I yeah, think Lance yeah. played the husband. It was a TV movie. And I was supposed to play her son. I mean, that's who I was auditioning for. I got to the last round of callbacks. And this is one of my first auditions. And I lost out and I was just heartbroken because this would have been huge. You know, it was a lead in a TV movie with, you know, one of my first auditions. 
And it took me, you know, I, I took me a while. I was reeling from that. And this other movie came, comes up like a year and a half later to play Jill Clayburgh's son again. And I booked it. <laughs> and I told her the story. And she says, you know what? I remember they told me about you, actually. They loved you. She said, but they were just worried because you had, like you were saying, I had so little set experience. And it was a very emotional role. And it was like, and I think they were a little worried about going with someone so green. You know, I feel like I saw that movie. I used to watch all those made for TV things back yeah. in the day. But but can you imagine like to get a second opportunity to play her son again and then book Yeah, it? I mean, I, I I really do love life that way when there's you know, there's such interesting stories like that, just opportunities yeah. that you know can come around a second a second time, which doesn't always happen, but when they do, I think you you're just even more grateful. Um had you ever watched a soap opera before as the world turns came calling? The only glimpses I've got, I got of soap operas before I worked on one was when my sister used to watch Luke and Laura on General <laughs> Hospital when I was a kid, I would, she would be watching it occasionally. But no, I really was not a, a daytime television watcher at all. And, and what do you remember about your audition and screen test? Did you have to screen test? Uh, yeah. So I auditioned for a casting director in LA. I was living in LA at the time. And um, they, then I got the call. They wanted to fly me to New York to screen test. And which I, is a nice thing. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, gosh, I'll do it. Uh, you know, it was thrilling. It was exciting. Um, I, at that point I had only spent like a few days in New York uh, at a film festival a few years before uh, so I was really not familiar with New York much at all. And it was exciting. Yeah, it was great. And I auditioned with, um, uh, who did, who did I screen test? Did I read with, see what happened was I was there to read for David Stenbeck. They actually had me read for Chris Hughes too, on the, on the fly, on the spot. They said, do you oh, mind wow. auditioning for this other role too? So I <laughs> That's got so the, funny. They were always looking for a Chris Hughes. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, uh, so I, I, I think I read with, was it Terry Khan? Maybe I read with two. Yeah, read with it, yes, you might be right because I I do believe Terry was reading with. Um, that is probably when Ben Jorgensen got the he role. He came in right after. Yeah, yeah. So so I read with Leslie, I think, for for the David Stenbeck part. And then when I was done, they were like, "Hey, you mind doing this?" I said, "Give me these sides." I'm like, uh, "Okay, you know," and uh, got off book as quick as I could. And so I screen tested for both of them. Um, you know, and then found out pretty quickly that I got the the Stenbeck role when I got home. Yeah. And and how did you brush up on who Stenbeck was, and and uh, did did you meet Anthony at that time? And so so that was an interesting thing. So I had scenes with him pretty quickly after I got on the show, and frankly, I got like these sort of ominous warnings from various people up about him, you know, that he might be, you know, difficult or whatever. And and I always reserve judgment on that stuff because I, I've I've known people and I've met people in, in the artistic realm who, who have been deemed difficult and they're just perfectionists. They just want the work to be good. And not everyone is on the same page with that because it can make your work days a little longer or whatever, you know. So I, I you know, left my mind open and he actually reached out to me and said, do you want to run meet and run these scenes? And I was like, great. Yeah, I was all for that. You know, so we met at the big museum there in the city. I'll never forget this and um, had coffee and talked about the characters. He told me all this info backstory information. You know, we, we read our lines a little bit casually and I thought he was great. You know, I, I just saw a man who was really dedicated to the work and wanted it to be good. And I I wanted to be, you know, I was new on the show. I wanted to make a splash. I was all for it, you know, and and then. Uh, I'll never forget to just a funny side story. When we were leaving the museum, uh, we're in the lobby and this elderly woman shuffles up to him and she says, I know you, you're a movie star. And he says, no, ma'am, I'm a television star. <laughs> I just remember thinking that was so funny, him wanting to make that distinction, you know. That is so funny. Um, Colleen, when I, Colleen and I were talking, did, do you recall... Um, she says like Anthony's warm up is that he bounces a lot. Do you recall? He like is jumping up and down. I don't know if he still did that when I don't because I was probably doing my own weird thing. You know? <laughs> I, I didn't notice. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, you know, I was, uh, 
I was really in it in those scenes. But like, I love I, I love that he he did that because you know people revered James as a villain and and the fact that he took the time to inform you and get to know you and and you know really the outcome of that is just to make all of it better. You know that yeah, like Exactly. And I was so nice to discover that that was probably the the, the genesis of his difficulty you know he wants it to be good clearly you know yeah absolutely he wants to people, that. people to believe it was there someone when you uh arrived in oakdale who took you sort of under their wing was it him was it leslie somebody it, that, that was leslie yeah, yeah. Uh, you know I, I was thrown into an alien world there like i i had already been working for a decade but it was all primetime guest stars um, a lot of prime, uh, primetime TV movies, a, you know, a few low budget features, a little bit of theater, but all very different, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, my style, the way I was taught to act, you know, unless a character called for being more flamboyant was to play things pretty subtle and close to the vest, you know, and, and try to really ground everything in reality. And I'll never forget after like my first week of working at Felicia, you know, the executive producer yeah. called me to the office and she said, hey, I hear you're having a, you know, a little difficulty with some of the directors, you know, whatever about the tone and stuff. And she gave me some speech about how we have 15 seconds to tell the public who you are or something like that. You know, that's what I remember from the talk, this thing about they need to know who you are immediately, you know? And I was like, oh, I said, well, you know, okay. You know, I got a job to do here if that's what you guys want. So it was tough for me. I had to adjust my style and start twisting the, the mustache, you know? And, <laughs> And and that was uncomfortable for me, but I committed to it as much as I could. I wanted to give them what they wanted. You know, I was there to do a job for them. And then uh, she was happy with the adjustments I made, you know, at that point. Um, but, you know, so it was an alien world to me, you know, in terms of that aspect of it creatively, as well as just being on the on the same sound, sound stage every day, because a lot of stuff I had shot before, you know, we were on some stages, but it was a lot of location work, you know. And, and you didn't have to learn 30 pages of dialogue at one time. Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge difference. Yep. Um, but but you asked me about uh, Leslie. Yeah, Leslie couldn't have been more wonderful in that aspect. She just, you know, really helped me out with, um, you know, not only just rehearsing in the acting perspective, but just teaching me about, you know, the, the block, you know, block rehearsals and all this stuff and how, how the day progressed and that. And she walked me through all that and uh, was extremely helpful. Yeah. It's it's a alien world when you you know if if anybody watching knows what how TV primetime movies are, um, you know it, it's yeah it, I it's mean, a whole different ball of wax. It's a factory, you know. It, it's it's a it's a fast moving you know machine that will wait yeah. for no one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is definitely. Well, I'm going to throw out names. So, you know, tell me what it was like working with them or what comes to mind. Martha sure. Byrne. Uh, fun, funny, talented, um, laid back, easy to get along with. That's that's the, the short of it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, Cassandra Creech. Uh, I didn't get to know Cassandra that well. Uh, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of stuff, to, material together. And, um, but from what I know of her, just sweet, you know, talented, committed to the work. I don't have a negative thing to say about her. She was just a doll, you know, like she was. And, and what, you know, Leslie, quite the talent. What, what was it like working opposite Leslie? Uh, it, it was great. For, you know, for one thing, she did then and still has a stellar work ethic. So, you know, like when I, when we'd arrive in the morning for rehearsal, you know, other than me, because I was new and nervous and that's just the way I love, I can't be overprepared. You know, that's my motto. She was the only other person that just came in that I remember newer lines, cold, ready to go. Could have, could have shot the moment she walked into the studio. Wow. Um, and I so appreciate that because once you're off book, then you really have the freedom to explore and find moments and because you're not reaching, you're not looking for lines and, you know, and, and it really allowed us, I think, to, you know, analyze the text and find great moments. And, um, and she's just talented and committed and it's always great to work with someone like that, you know? 
Absolutely. And I, I agree with you. You could tell when somebody knows it and they just play. Yeah. It's a whole, it's a whole other element. Uh, Kelly Menahan. Uh, well, again, I didn't have a lot with, you know, I think I had more interaction, much more interaction with Kelly, you know, like off camera, but even that I didn't see her a lot, but, uh, yeah, I, I liked her. I can't say a whole lot because I, I didn't get to know her that well, but you know, she just seemed like a talented actress, a nice person. Dave, Dave had just had a lot, uh, it, it at your eulogy to you, you spoke to each of them yeah but a lot of that was like you know pre-history right. before Correct. it was it was it was prior to you yeah um but annie paris okay annie yeah <laughs> the biggest thing i remember about annie is we would be rehearsing you know in the makeup room or whatever and you know we had some pretty heavy like greek tragedy kind of stuff yeah. going on and it could get a little you know like silly sometimes or melodramatic and we would start joking around while we were rehearsing about certain lines and playing with those lines and ad-libbing funny stuff, you know. And we would get, I remember a couple of days getting on the set and, you know, we'd be doing our scene and those lines, and then those lines come up and you're sorry you did that because I would see her eyes start to narrow and this, her mouth start to crawl. And then the floodgates would open. And we had a couple of days where, and I'm sure the directors were pissed, like we just couldn't get it back. We just could not stop laughing. And, and, uh, you know, if there's one thing I remember about Annie, it's just that we we really had a fun time, you know, uh, making each other laugh with that stuff. Um, mostly off camera, hopefully, you know, on yeah. camera. What do you remember about shooting that eulogy? Do you remember anything about? Uh, yeah. So it was a lot of dialogue, as you know, just me <laughs> talking for a long time. I rehearsed the, the F out of it you know, found all my moments and beats, you know, really worked hard on it. And then I came in and I can't remember who was directing that day. I think it was, I think it was Ellen, Ellen Wheeler. Oh, I think yeah. Was, yeah. And she just said, you know, look, you know, I know this is a big thing. She's, I just have a few things I need you to do. So she was like, I need you to pause here, 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 and here so that we can cut to the women, whatever, at this line. This, line. And I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> and we shot. And I did it all in one take and we moved on. And I remember like, wow. I, I finished, I remember finishing the monologue and there's this silence because I know everyone's expecting this to probably take, you know, hour. And uh, there's this long silence and I'm sitting there staying in it because I think we're going to go. She's like, I think we're moving on. And then the, the camera guys are like, yeah, yeah it's not going to take four hours. Yay. Um, but uh, uh, anyway. well, before I, before I show us the, the eulogy, Michael says, Keith was fantastic. He entered a world that had such strong history with Anthony Herrera and Colleen Zink. The funeral scene was unforgettable. Keith was so strong and engaging. He delivered so much intrigue, excitement, and powerful acting. Oh, that's Michael Park? No, no, no. A, a fan, Michael. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so, you know, it's still nice. You know, no, yeah. no, it's going to come from Michael Park, but it's okay. Yeah. Let's no, take a look. Going to the very end. Good afternoon, ladies. If you're watching this tape, it can mean only one thing. I'm finally in a room with all my favorite I women. I really remember The loveliest too. ladies of Oakdale. I'm not fooling myself. I know you came here to bury me, not to praise me. And I didn't invite you because I expect any pretense of grief or mourning. I invited you because I'd like to leave you each with a little something by which you can remember me. <laughs> As if you could ever forget, right? Lily Snyder. We could have been siblings, but we ended up being so much more, didn't we? It's true what they say. The important things in life are love and family. The year that I raised the child you call Faith, I loved her as though she were my own. I whispered stories to her at night. I told her of my hopes and dreams for her. She'll never forget me, her first real daddy. And she'll never let you forget, Lily, because as the years pass, you'll see flashes of me and our little girl. You'll try to pass it off as a phase or a rough patch, but the tantrums will come, the willfulness, and you'll remember. You'll always remember. And you'll wonder, was it that time she spent with me? Good luck. To her, I leave all my love. Denise Maynard, hello, lap dancer extraordinaire. I hear you've clawed your way out of the gutter. I'll bet you're wearing something very respectable, proper, so no one will remember how you used to make a buck. Let me clue you in on something, Denise. These people don't forget, unless it suits them. 
So you will always be the stripping whore who took money in exchange for a child. I am happy to report, though, when Hope reaches the age of 21, she will inherit $100,000, plus a detailed personal letter and scrapbook of her inauspicious beginnings. It'll hit all the highlights, how she was born in a back room like a stray, the fetal alcohol syndrome, how you sold her to me and denied her for months. A real medley of your hits, Denise. Enjoy. And then there's Molly Conlon, the love of my life. I will miss you in more positions, ways than you can possibly imagine. But I leave nothing to you, my love, because you'll never be without me, will you? I'm under your skin. I'm in I mean, you're really can't I'm believe you soul. did this in one. I really do own you, Molly, and I am never leaving you. Never. Julia Lindsay Snyder, my raven haired angel, or so you've convinced the world, but I'm not fooled because I know your secret. Mm hmm. The one you're trying to keep from Jack. Yeah. Secret's like a viper, Julia. The second you turn your back, and I will make sure that secret comes out when you least expect it, when you turn your back. And you know that's a promise I can keep. Incredible. Incredible. Oh, uh, Susan just said it was like a solitary soliloquy that was fantastic. Oh, and, I, uh, I, just to, I just wanted to say for a second, for the Michael, yeah. gave me that kind compliment. I really appreciate yeah. that. Thank you for the kind words. He, he, I, he went on to say it's in his top 10 unforgettable scenes. And um, I know that he's an actor because Michael and I know each other. So he uh, comments. But... He's That's a big really World high. Turns fan. Big, big World Turns fan. Um, I love also that Ellen Wheeler uh, directed it. Love that. Well, they also, you know, that day, th there was a lot going on outside of what I was doing. You know, they had a steady cam that, or a, a jib that day that they never used. They brought special equipment in. They, they lit the show differently. And I think they won some Emmys for the technical aspects of that episode. So... They, they, you know, they, they treat it almost like a self-contained little noir, stylistically speaking, piece, you know. Well, when I went looking for it yesterday, the day before, I totally, you know, I hadn't thought about that scene in so long. And the minute it popped up, it just brought back these memories of seeing it live when we were doing it. And I was just like, wow, that was some good stuff that the show. It was a creative way to get rid of David. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Yes. And I, I, and I, if I recall correctly, I mean, it's been so long, but everybody was talking about it. They just loved it. You know, like the soap press fans, it was just, you know, it was a, a unique send off your body there, the video there and the women there. Absolutely. Yeah. And having so many characters there at once that people love to see. And it, it was, yeah. you know, a nice confluence of interesting elements. Yeah. Oh, uh, Travis says, I hated that the writers didn't make Lucinda David's mom. <laughs> when when you think back on your time in Oakdale, um, was it a good experience for you? Yeah. I mean, look, there were it, it, there were certainly difficulties, you know, that that came along with the experience. But I think um, overall, you know, it, it was a wonderful opportunity, you know, um, I look, it yielded my two favorite people in the world, right? <laughs> my sons. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I'm going to look city for that reason alone. Yeah. You know, um, but it was certainly challenging, as I told you in the beginning, just, you know, from a creative perspective, it, it, I had to sort of adjust how I was used to performing. Um, and uh, I you know I certainly was never used to the kind of fan deluge of like, you know, fan attention and, and that kind of stuff was, was new for me. And, uh, but yeah, overall it was great. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't trade it in for anything. Uh, yeah. That's so, it, it's such a different time. Ooh. Sorry. The phone started to ring. How did the role of Keith on one life to live come about? So I'm, I, if I remember correctly, it was a couple writers that moved from as the world turned that that were in on writing david stenbeck that went over to one life and i i sorry i can't remember their names but they wrote that keith schaefer role for for me oh wow uh, uh you know his name is keith you know yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and they want me to do the the, uh, the the same thing you know uh yeah so who did you get to work with over there uh 
oh gosh, now I can't believe her name is escaping me. She was the a young blonde ingenue on the show. Uh, I'm Star now her name Manning? Escaping. Star Kristen Alderson, maybe, or no. Um, uh, but but, but uh, is it Timothy Stickney? Was that an actor that was on Steve there? Stickney, yeah. I did, I did some yeah. scenes with him. Uh, David Fumero, who I thought was. Oh, yeah, really, I love David. Yeah, he's great. He was such a good guy, man. He was so easy to work with and just, you know, we had some fun chats off camera, too, and I, I really liked him a lot. Oh, hey, Stephen. Was it Gina Tagnoni, maybe? Nope. I don't think so, because Gina was um, on. I, yeah, I can't believe it. She was very young. I, I can't. I'm surprised I can't remember her name. But she had, like, with David Fumero's character, she had a romance with. Um, oh, okay. I think. Uh, was it David Fumero? I don't know. It, yeah, it might be. Um, did you watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine? No. Comedy? Because uh, David's wife was in it, and she's she was fun in that. Well, David uh, was in it, too, right? Didn't David play he a character? I had a guess. It might yeah, be Bree Williamson. Bree Williamson. Okay. From a uh, Oh, wait. Uh, no, I don't think that was it either. Bree Williamson. Jessica Morris. Yes. Yes. That's Jessica one. Morris, it might be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Um, just a side note, I because I was the page at ABC, I know, you know, One Life was filmed in that beautiful building. I loved that castle where One Life to Live was filmed. Mm -hmm. Right yeah. at uh, Lincoln Center. Yeah, right around Lincoln. Um, yeah, I mean, that was an interesting time. Uh, you know, I had, I had a child. I had an infant at home. That was when 9-11 happened during that period. And I, I, yeah. I remember, because uh, I had been driving to work right up past the towers, like, several days a week during that stint on One Life, because we lived in Brooklyn at uh, Park Slope. So I would drive. Right. I, I thought you I, lived in Brooklyn. And I happened to have off that morning, and I'll never forget, you know. Leslie waking me up and being like, something's going down, you know? And uh, so that, you know, it was an interesting time. A lot, lot, lot happening, both in my personal life and, you know. Yeah New, yeah, New York was uh, quite a place at that, at that time. Um, cra yeah, crazy time. Talk about um, Shadow People. W what was it about? Where did the idea come from? And... What was it like wearing every hat possible? <laughs> well, it, it came at a time when, um, you know, it was post soap opera back in LA. And I, I frankly was just not, the ball was not rolling the way I, I wanted it to. And I thought I, I need to just create something, you know, and um, I had already directed a, a low budget feature for this company that I knew. Uh, I had a friend that worked at this company that had a, they wanted to start a production wing. So they had some money to put into a movie and they actually financed the first movie that I, that I uh, wrote and directed. And then I went back to them with this idea of doing just like a gritty relationship drama that had kind of a European feel to it that could be shot very contained. And they liked the pitch and they financed another go for me, you know, and I, I wrote the screenplay and um, wrote parts for Leslie and myself and, uh, um, you know, did the whole thing, it went out, location scouted, uh, you know, found the personnel for the crew, you know, and uh, and just went for it. And um, it was very intense. It was like a 17 day shoot, you know, a lot of very emotional stuff, you know, and a lot of running back and forth behind the monitor to, you know, look at stuff and make sure we were doing what we needed to be doing. And um, yeah, it was intense. I, you know, I had high hopes for that, but when you're shooting on such a low budget, there's always that um, that feeling when it's over of like, I didn't really shoot it the way I wanted to, didn't really have the time to do it, you know, justice. But it was also, I don't know, you know, it, it's maybe the screenplay could have been better. You know, I should have done a few more passes on or something. But we did get a little bit of attention at some festivals. And um, yeah, I mean, it was certainly, again, a wonderful learning experience. Very you intense. You like the directing side of things? Yeah. Yeah. I like it all. Um, I, I obviously I enjoy acting, loved directing and lo have loved writing since I was a child and, uh, and editing, frankly, I like a lot as well. Yeah. Do you still and, write now? Like, are you right? Do you write things that you're just holding on to for, you know, for that right moment? 
I do, but it, it is hard now, you know, work because I do work full time now in the corporate yeah. world and um, it's, it's tough to find time. Um, but I do have stuff that I can see someday getting, you know, putting it out there when I can polish it up and finish it. You know, I did over the years, I started, started and finished so many screenplays that I want to either revisit or finish or, you know, um, maybe in retirement, I'll get back to that. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, well, but it was interesting, but with shadow yeah, people, it's interesting well. as a writer, because when you write something and then direct it and edit it, you really learn about a lot about the writing process, about what you don't need. Like there were scenes, we shot whole scenes. And when I was editing, I realized we don't even need this scene because it was done visually. It was already conveyed in another scene visually. We don't even need all this dialogue. You know, you learn really how to streamline your writing a bit, you know? Well, and I think also having, um, you know, writing it, directing it, acting in it, you know what you were looking for. Yeah. You know, in everything. I mean, it's your idea. It's your baby. You know, I think that probably adds a very uh, honest reality to the project, whatever project, whoever, you know, gets involved, writers and directors out there today. Um, yeah. It's very, it can become very, yeah. Who are some of the directors you, you admire? Oh, uh, you know what's interesting? I tend to, uh, what's the word, um, remember and respect and appreciate moments or individual works more than people because, you know, there, there are, you know, I'll see an actor just do something in a moment and I, and I log it away and go, that was brilliant. Even if I don't like the actor necessarily, the rest of their yeah. work, it doesn't negate what they did in that certain moment. Same thing with music or musicians, you know, like, you know, do, do I care for Taylor Swift? Not, not really, but does she have a couple songs I think are bangers? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and, and you, so for me, it was always more about that. Having said that, you know, the obvious ones, Kubrick, uh, Fincher, uh, I'd love, um, PT Anderson, um, you know, Boogie Nights, Magnolia, uh, uh, Richard Linklater has a really special place in my heart just cause he's done so many movies that I adore. But, um, but yeah, I tend to just remember scenes, moments, things like that, that I, that I log away that are effective um, more so than people. It, anything you've seen recently that you absolutely loved? Oh, what is the last? I've seen a lot of things that I like, but I uh, love. God, what is the last new thing that I loved? I not frank no i can't i can't think of anything that sticks out unfortunately yeah that's it no i've heard a lot of people say that to some degree like like i'm on letterboxd i don't know if you're on there no but, is that like um sort of like you can rent movies or something no no it's, it's an app where you can watch and review movies and give them a you know and then you can share it with your friends around there too and you can see what they're watching you can put on a list what you're looking to watch in the future and look at your friends list and share so it's kind of a cool place and you can look at other people's reviews and um is kind that of cool. like an app is it an app yeah. yeah it's a phone app oh i gotta look that up huh yeah it's, letterboxd uh, letterboxd yeah so um but you know i look back at like the, the dozen or so i've watched recently and they're all like three stars three and a half stars you know like i liked them they were great but they didn't you know give me that which is fine you know they're still entertaining but yeah i watched a lot of the movies this year for the Academy Awards, it's been a long time since I've really watched a lot because we're, well, we're. What have you loved? So maybe you. We're, we're more TV people. Yeah. Um, um, I really thought Poor Things was artistically just a phenomenal film. Um, I don't know. Did you see it? I did. Yeah. I, I, I visually, it was like every piece of the screen was like a piece of art in. I, I completely agree. I, I think it was um, visually stunning and unique and I couldn't take my eyes off it. Yeah. Correct. I, I feel like I had never seen anything like that. So artistically it, without the acting or even the screenplay, just visually, it was just, you know, I was like every piece could hang in somebody's home as a. I, I agree. It, it was utterly unique. And, and, you know, because along with that, that beauty and, 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 um, 
you know, interesting, the interesting aspects of it visually. He was doing things weird, like, uh, you know, it didn't fit into any time period. It, it, it was, it was an alien world that he created. Yeah. Everything was just not like you're used to seeing it. You know, like, oh, we're in Lisbon. It's like, oh, okay. You know, like, and then fish eye lenses a lot too, you know, yeah, to distort the image at times. Um, and I did think she was phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, the acting was, yeah. The moment to moment stuff was just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, she's, she's something, but that was, that visually just really blew me away. Um, yeah. Well deserving of any award for the, the visual aspect. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Um, yeah, that's, that's wild. So tell us what you're doing today. I, I was fascinated backstage. You told me about that. Yeah. So I'm in audio description now. Which you know, when I say that, most people glaze, you know get a glazed look. Uh, so I, I'm creative manager of a department that uh, writes and narrates audio tracks for television and film uh, that describe the action, the characters, the settings for the blind and sight impaired. So um, we write scripts where we describe between the dialogue and the pertinent side effects, uh, sound effects that help the blind audience understand what's going on. Um, it's mandatory for all new, most people don't know it exists, but as I told you, it's mandatory for all new programming. Anything you're watching on the streaming services, if you toggle to your audio, you'll see it'll say either descriptive audio or audio description, and you'll hear someone like myself or someone describing what's happening, you know, like, uh, and um, it's done for theatrical releases as well. Uh, so the blind and sight impaired audience can get a headset at a theater. Most theaters are equipped with it. I think they have to be. And they can hear, you know, someone describing for them while they're watching with the rest of the sighted audience. Who is responsible for paying for that? Is it the the it, it's, it's, it's the studio. The client, like for instance, we have a, co a contract with uh, Apple TV Plus. So my company, we do all the audio description for every trailer episode feature that they release. We do the audio description, and they pay us, yeah, to do it. So, and and it is mandatory. So, has it? Do you know if it's been that way for like decades? Mandatory. Well, I know audio description has been around, I think, since the '80s. But I, I think in terms of it being mandatory, it's it's still pretty new. I, I think within the last decade, for sure. Yeah, I, I my yeah. early career was working uh, for the Walt Disney Company in movies, and I don't recall ever hearing about that. Yeah, at all. It, it's still relatively new. The the, the mandatory aspect. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Apple TV has got some great shows. Yeah, they're just cranking it out, man. And it's like any A-list star you can think of is now doing something on Apple TV Plus. Like, yeah, the, I'm, I'm currently watching the new look, which is uh, um, takes place during World War II uh, around well, the fashion uh, one. Yes, yeah, Coco yeah, yeah. Chanel and yeah. Yeah, it's Chris funny Lee. because. We because we work with all security titles internally. Uh, so a lot of times somebody says the real title of a show, I'm like, what is, I have to, you know, stop and think about it. Oh, they don't, show. oh, for security purposes. Yeah, it, extremely high security with this stuff. Like, um, so yeah, there's a lot of precautions taken with it. Got, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, like, just like the email traffic, you know, doesn't have, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I, when I was in movies, like, you know, People had to come to a theater to see something. And now they, you know, send you a link with a, you know, encrypted code and you can watch it at, at home, which is just mind blowing to me. Um, yeah. Do you have a dream project in, in your head like you'd love to do? Not, not really at this point. You know, it's interesting because my, uh, you know, dream was never all that elaborate, to be honest with you. I just wanted to be a working actor and make a living at it. You know, I, I envy people like, uh, I always think of people like Scott Glenn or um, uh, Dermot Mulroney or, you know, these guys that they're stars, you know, but they but they can live their lives and, and, you know, go out in public and not probably not be mobbed all the time or whatever. I love mm -hmm. those careers. And I would have been, you know, I was always perfectly happy with something like that or even less, you know, just, making a living doing what I love to do, you know? So I, I really never had these huge, you know, uh, delusions of grandeur about some massive, you know, project or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, but now, it, it, you know, I'd say now the dream is simple. It would be, it'd be fun to, 
just be on sets again and, and, and work at some point doing what I love to do. You know, I, I mean, what I do now is creative and, and it's certainly, you know, a nice uh, uh, plan B, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, I miss being on sets. And, and that's the dream is just if look, yeah. if you can if you can get paid doing something you love to do, there are so many people in the in this country. But look at the world at large. If you don't hate what you're doing for a living, you're, you're doing pretty good. Right. You know, that's a step in the right direction. I agree. Yeah, you know, so yeah. it's like, so yeah, it'd be fun to to make a few bucks doing it again at some point. And you know, we we were talking before that I could see it coming around for me again when I'm uh, you know, at a different stage in the not too distant future. That's awesome. Yeah, and I actually, you know, you, character actors I think are the the more interesting actors than movie stars. Yeah, well, they they yeah they certainly get to do some wonderful roles and um and disappear into things and and have a wonderfully varied body of work, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I hope to see you someday do it again. I think you should. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Such a pleasure to see you, Keith. You too, Alan. It's always been nice. I, I always remember you just being a, a smiling, kind presence and uh, looks like you haven't changed at all. I try. <laughs> you as well, my friend. You stay well. Say hello uh, out there to everybody. I will. Thanks a lot. I'll see you. Bye, my friend. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you to Keith Kaloris for spending the hour with us. Please join me next Wednesday, March 27th, when Guiding Lights, Amelia Marshall, Amelia Marshall and Patrona Paoli stop by. And at 7 p.m. on the 27th, Holocaust survivor Dr. Eliza Erber will join me for an episode of Conversations with Alan. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And if you'd like to stream audio versions, just search The Locker Room on your favorite streaming platform. I hope you all have a great weekend. And as always, please stay safe.